Okay, welcome to the lockdown conversation tonight. We are very glad we're joining this evening with Branko Milanovic, the renowned economist um, currently in Washington. Hello, Branko. Good evening. Hello, Yagoda. So it's a pleasure to be there. I hope the connection would be would be good. Let's see how it is. I, I missed you for a bit. Yeah, I hope I hope it will be good. Branko is here joining us to talk about the current crisis, Corona crisis, its economic impacts. Let me just say a few words to the lockdown conversation. It is a format we created in the Intercultural Center in Heidelberg because we're not allowed to gather with the people and debate. And so we hope that we can contribute to understanding the crisis and go through the crisis by talking to bright and sharp minds like you are and who will help us sort out the current uh, situation. So Branko Milanovic is, of course, an economist and has had a uh, yeah, very, uh, very interesting past, both in the World Bank for 10 years, being in a rather bureaucratic surrounding, and on the other hand, as an academic, researching, teaching, But mostly what I found very interesting is that you have been co constantly contributing to the public debate. So you're one of the few researchers who have both seen the practical world, been close to politics, and managed to translate your knowledge into the broad public. So I'm very happy that you're here to share an hour with us and go through these um, really awkward times where we have so many different opinions, so many con conspiracy theories and things that are important to understand, I think. So let me first find out about your situation. Where are you and what's going on around your house? Well, first, thank you very much, Jagoda, for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure. And uh, yes, we are all, uh, as you said, actually, it, it is very awkward time. Uh, none of us could have actually in December last year imagined that in four months we would be in a situation like now. Uh, I was a little bit, for some reason, obsessed with the virus. So I actually even remember the day, when, because on Twitter, I saw it like on the 31st of December. And it's actually odd because when the previous outbreak outbreaks happened, like with the age one and one and so on, I was rather kind of unconcerned. But with this one, I don't know why, maybe because just we have many, much more information. We know what's happening in the rest of the world. So I was from the very beginning uh, quite uh, concerned and I was a little bit surprised, I have to say, as we are now talking how people have reacted, how people essentially paid no attention to it here in the US. I mentioned on Twitter that, for example, there was a very large conference called by National Bureau of Economic Research in, here in Washington on the 7th and 8th of March. And they refused to, post, to cancel the conference because they just, said, well, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, anyway, so that's how it was now in Washington. I'm in Washington now. I, mean, let me uh, just, we, I think that's something very interesting. You're pointing out that the whole world has been like in a coma. Nobody was reacting. We had a shutdown of an 11 million people city in China and nobody, no press, no correspondents were actually reacting. As you said, till mid-March, we had the feeling like it's going to be a flu and now we have the biggest pandemic ever. So how do yeah, you... I, I, I find this really quite extraordinary because let me give you another example. I was watching because I like to watch, you know, football. So I was absolutely with disbelief watching the games, Champions League. That was, I think the last game was on the 12th of March. And you had, I mean, I remember, I think it was the Liverpool um, Atletico Madrid. You had like 60, 70,000 people and you know, this is going to explode. and nobody was paying much attention. Um, so nowadays in the US, of course, everybody is criticizing rightly the, the lack of reaction of the administration, the fact that the Trump was you know, playing down the numbers, did nothing, and the CDC was kind of gutted out, all that. But I have to say that that feeling of uh, uh, lack of concern was present among other people. So it's not only the top. It was really, I, I, my impression was actually, it was pretty widespread. Yeah, I really think you're right, because what, we, what I read was when in China they started criticizing the authorities about celebrating New Year's events and whatever, there were already people disappearing there because of criticizing them and nobody cared about the people disappearing. So there's really something awkward going on. And as you said, on the other hand, 
There's been information that in the States, there were people who knew at the end of January and were selling their stocks after they had been informed in the White House about what's going to yeah. be, but it didn't translate into any kind of action. So um, how does it feel in Washington? I mean, what, what, what kind of a shutdown are you experiencing? Well, I was, of course, in New York first in, in the beginning, in March, and then when the situation got worse there, and also because there were rumors that New York would be quarantined so that you won't be able to get out. What I did, of course, I did get out precisely for that reason. So that actually also shows the problems with quarantine is you, if you announce, that happened, as you know, in Lombardy, you announce it beforehand, and of course, everybody runs away. So basically what you have done, you have just spread. Now in the US, and you know, I think that politically it's impossible to close down a given area. So in any ways, I, I came to Washington the situation in Washington is uh, getting worse. It has been now 60 days of the technical lockdown. And uh, essentially, you have to stay at home. You know, stores are closed, but the supermarkets selling uh, food and all that, they are open. And small stores are open. Restaurants are actually delivering quite a lot of food. But obviously, you cannot go there and eat. And big public events are all closed. But you can go and run, you can go and uh, walk, you can take your dog. Uh, the rules are not enforced. I think it's different with Germany. I've seen many people basically like congregating in groups. Nobody enforces anything. Um, so the, the, the numbers are getting steadily worse every day, more infections and more dead. And Washington is very unequal, as you know, in terms of income and in terms of geographical distribution where the rich people live compared to the poor people. And that shows very well in the statistics. Yeah, there's been a huge, I mean, you have very statistics we in Germany don't have in that way. You have an ethnic st statistics, you have a socioeconomic statistics, and it's shown, shown that the people from ethnic minorities and poor people are really paying the toll for this kind of loose politics of handling the crisis. You have, if I come to this, you have um, tweeted something that I find very remarkable a few days ago. It's for sure provocative because that's often the way you are on Twitter, which I actually like. It says, Branko Milanovic tweeted, if the government that has an incredible amount of resources, as in the US, cannot protect people's lives, the number one requirement, then why do we have the government or democracies or whatever? So that's something you tweeted. Maybe yeah. sometimes on Twitter, it's awkward when you put it out. But what I found interesting about this in Germany, we have this um, fight going on about economists saying, you know, you can't do the lockdown. You can't use financial resources from the states. Everything's going to break down. And uh, you have to understand that uh, pandemics and there's a biology. There was even a thesis that we have to accept people dying because it's nature. So you argue that, as you said, it's a number one requirement to save lives. Where would you position yourself in this ongoing battle between we need to save the economy and we need to take measures to protect the lives of the people? How, how do you look at this as an economist? Yeah, I, I would let me try to kind of break this question into two parts. First of all, I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned this tweet. I actually think that uh, the reason, I mean, going back to Hobbes, the reason why we have governments is precisely to protect lives because obviously an assumption was, of course, if we didn't have the governments, you would just go and kill each other, which is not unreasonable. But we have government in order precisely first to protect lives and to protect public order. All the rest, I think, comes later. Now, if you have, and that's what's striking in the case of the United States, if you have a government that is extremely powerful in terms of resources, and not only, I don't mean only the, the federal government, I mean the state governments and all that. You have a country which is, of course, among the richest in the world. You have the country which is in top in terms of technological developments. I was just reading today, I wonder like how many hundreds of schools of public health exist in the United States. So you have all that infrastructure and that infrastructure clearly has failed. So something is wrong if the US now has like one third of all the cases, one third of the death and all of that. Uh, then, of course, the, 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 the question that you ask is, I mean, uh, what is the repercussions of that? Why, what do we need to do in the future so that it does not happen again? 
Now, on uh, the question like uh, the trade-off, implicit trade-off between the lockdown and the economy, I really don't think that there is really a trade-off because if you, uh, you need healthy people to work, you cannot have an economy operating if people are not, all, I mean, are getting sick. And you, we, you see now that it's not only older people, it's also people of the working age and even kids are getting sick. So in that situation, opening up would totally overwhelm the health system of practically any country. And of course, you would not have workers who would go to jobs if they have to have, if they, they are likely to become sick there. So I don't think that actually there is a real trade-off. You have first to deal to the extent, obviously not to eradicate because it would be very difficult, it would take a long time, but to make sure that you minimize the likelihood of people getting infected very strongly minimized. And then you can start, as I think many countries are trying to do now, opening little by little. Opening and also with a concept of hygiene and knowing more about the virus, we know how to avoid and how to behave. I think this also helps. You had this um, interesting approach uh, on, uh, that you published in the, foreign, in the magazine Foreign Affairs today, where you not only argued about this, but also thought about the implications for the global economy. I mean, this is a virus and a pandemic that tremendously affects the global economy. So um, you described yeah. about how this might bring us back to a time with you compared to the Roman, uh, Roman Empire in the fourth to sixth century, where things had to cut down to self-sufficiency. So maybe you can Yeah, talk to us about this danger that you, is it a danger or is it a chance of being self-sufficient? Is it, what is it? Uh, it is a danger. No, of course, I, I don't mean that we would actually, even under the worst uh, scenario of this virus, we are not going to, you know, this, uh, I mean, the society is not going to disintegrate the way that the Roman Empire disintegrated. Because, of course, in the case of Roman Empire, there are other, of course, elements like wars, Uh, instability, inflation, epidemics that actually led to the decline of the and the fall of the Western part. Now, of course, people forget that that part was not at that time as important in the Eastern part. So it was really the Western part that actually collapsed. The Eastern part did not. Now, uh, I don't think it would go to the situation that we have a sort of self-sufficient economies. I just wanted to indicate that what actually we have been before the crisis And even before the global financial crisis, we have been in a situation of very high globalization, if you will, where obviously we get very specialized. Not only do countries get specialized in globalization, but we as individuals. And we have an incentive to get specialized because, of course, when we do, as we know that from Adam Smith onwards, we get more efficient in what we do. And then we communicate to trade with others. And of course, the overall economy expands. But what happens with the extreme cases like this one is that suddenly we, even as individuals, realize that our specialization might become a drawback. Let me give you a very nice example, Iago, that I think you must know and everybody does. Once we cannot interact with people freely, you know, you cannot invite to your home somebody to fix your utilities, to fix water, electricity, whatever, because you're afraid actually maybe that person is infected. You cannot go somewhere else and do something that you are good. Let's suppose you're a teacher, a tutor of French. You cannot go to somebody's home because they don't want you there because they don't know whether you would actually be infected or not. So in other words, what you suddenly realize in conditions like this is that very high level of specialization, which is an advantage under normal conditions, becomes this advantage now. So that's what I wanted to indicate. And of course, the extreme example of that is that everybody becomes self-sufficient. You have a domain like economies after the, the breakup of the Roman Empire. So I didn't mean that we would get there. I'm just saying this is the end point. Yeah, sure. Um, but what I find even inter more interesting is that you compared it to Katrina and to, to other crises that we had that ended up being humanitarian crises. And as you had, I mean, you have the number of unemployment that has risen up to yes. 30 33 million, I think is what I read. 33 million, yeah, today. So this is like the, the biggest number since the Great Depression, right? So Yes, that's what they say. Yeah, so I think um, what I found interesting about your approach is to think about social cohesion. 
So if we now don't take measures and don't take action to protect all these people in, in a way, as you said, what would you expect the worst case scenario to, to be? Or what, what would you consider stately measures to prevent that worst case scenario? I think the countries have taken measures in the sense that they are <clears throat> trying to guarantee people's incomes while they're not working, which is actually, I think, indispensable because you have very high percentage of people who obviously have no savings. And if you don't have jobs for two or three months and you don't have income, then how are you going to survive? You know, that raises, of course, so another issue. I just want to make parenthetically that comment that you have countries which are very developed and advanced with very high income and all that. And yet you have about 30 to 40 percent of people who have zero assets. So these people really need the economy on a daily basis or otherwise they would actually simply have to start selling their assets or they would go hungry. Now, if people at some point actually reach that position where there is no more support, they have no money, the question becomes at which point would you have the first sort of outbreak of some violence, which I don't think cannot be, can be excluded, and then how do you react to that? If you have people, it happened in Sicily quite a few times, and I saw that in Brazil also, people actually mobbing and going into a supermarket and taking food. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, if it happens once or twice, okay, you can deal with it. But if it happens 20 times, 50 times, then you do have a problem. And I think this is not something that can be taken lightly. Uh, so far, we have been lucky. There was no breakdown in social order, but it doesn't mean that if it continues two or three months like that, that would be the same. So what do you think needs to be done so it wouldn't happen? I mean, you, we, we don't have an idea about the length of the pandemic. We don't have, so what do you think should yeah. be done? I, I think we're really basically blind, uh, flying blind in that sense, because uh, as you said, we don't know how long this will continue. If we so I suppose assume that it will continue up to August, September. I think the governments, particularly of the rich countries, they have sufficient resources, which of course might create problems down the road, but at present at least, they have sufficient resources to protect people so that nobody really falls below a certain floor. But if it goes past that point, then really, you know, the issue is actually how long can you continue doing that? And uh, uh, then maybe at that point, we would actually, this um, sort of a trade-off that I said really at this stage, it seems to me, it's not a real trade-off between opening the economy and... is like the few people profiting, like when... So, you know, it is a striking fact that you have really now a need for that money and they're all quiet. Now, of course, some have made money, as you said, actually, basis because, of course, of the online um, retailing and, you know, trading. So things have, of course, some people have gained. But, of course, majority of people, even, I think, among the, the very rich, they, they, they probably lost because the stock market went down. And even now there is some recovery. But I think overall they would also lose. I think that everybody would lose. But it could be that in a percentage terms, that's actually what we who work with inequality, we look at percentage gains and losses. Uh, for the poor people, that could be the percentage wise, their loss may be higher than for the people, I mean, upper middle class and others. Uh, last point on that, Yago, the UNI are able to some extent continuing functioning and being paid uh, because we don't have to have a physical presence in our jobs. Uh, but people who work as cashiers, People who work in, in a retail sector, people who work in delivery, of course, they cannot stay at home and deliver things, you know, remotely. They have to go. They are like frontline workers. And of course, they are exposed, obviously, to possibility of infection, but they also have to work. So, you know, there, there is, and if they lose the job, they, of course, their income will go down to, to zero. So there is a difference, as we were saying before, between people who are able to continue more or less operating as before and those who cannot. So um, I would be interested in understanding a little better. I mean, you've researched about the middle class in China or about the rise of the urban middle class and how fast they have actually risen since 1988 to, to, to now. And in the US where you said there's more powers who are actually not trying to, to uh, 
um, to distribute the, the the wealth that there is. So you saw like these two huge power superpowers going in their economic ways in a very different way. How do you think will the middle class be affected in China and in the US? Who do you think, what will this mean in the global distribution of these two countries and, and, and where their middle classes will be? I mean, there has been Uh, Margrethe Vestager from the European Union said that there is a danger that there will be a huge sellout, that the economic uh, industry, that in the, the middle industry, for, for example, in, in Europe, that will not be able to sustain themselves, will now be bought by Chinese companies or by Chinese uh, industry. So how do you expect this to reshape the balance of these two economic powers in, in this global dynamics between Asia, Europe and the U.S.? You know, my impression is that uh, China, uh, despite the fact that they mishandled the, the origin of the crisis, so I don't need to go through that. I think we have all seen that originally the the, the epidemic was uh, not reported and uh, it was hushed and even people were, you know, sort of uh, punished if they, as you, you mentioned, the doctor who died and others. But afterwards, China handled it well. And when you compare the time that elapsed, for example, Wuhan was under lockdown for six weeks. Uh, we have been in the US now, like New York, or Washington, elsewhere, locked down for eight weeks. New York has actually improved clearly, but some other places have not. So, you know, uh, they, uh, when we look at China now, China is sort of not rebounding because nobody is going to rebound immediately, but all indicators are improving. They'll, For example, you know, one question whether the reporting is up, the factories that open up, they're reporting like something like 80 or 90 percent of production compared to the last year of the same months. So, you know, things have improved. Now, that means that actually, if you project that until the end of the year, and if there is no some phenomenal Uh, rebound in uh, Western countries, we would actually probably have China growing at two to three percent, and the advanced Western countries like declining at the rate of maybe five, six, or seven percent. So that means that actually the catch up between China and the rest of the rich world will actually accelerate. In that sense, the crisis, at least the short effect of the crisis, maybe for a couple of years, would be actually ironically favorable to China. So uh, I, I'm not sure really what it would all mean given the trade wars between the US and China, uh, given that actually the European position towards China is uh, changing and becoming much less favorable, you know, over the last couple of years it already started. But nevertheless, what it actually seems to indicate is that China would, in relative terms, improve its position. So when we're talking about this, I would like to go to the talking about leadership. I mean, you said that they are actually leading the crisis in a way, though we have an authoritarian regime, they're leading the crisis in favor of the people and you consider them to even be in a better position afterwards. Then looking at Europe, we have uh, Orban who's taking advantage of, of this for yeah. exceeding his power in a less democratic way. You have um, Donald Trump, where everybody here, at least, is quite confused about this kind of leadership. And um, so how do you, what do you think it, it will mean for the democracies? In, I mean, I know this is not just an economic question, but you think about authoritarian regimes a lot. I mean, how is it, you even mentioned in a tweet, I guess, is there a chance of, yeah, re-election or something? Is this being a good leadership in a crisis? What does this actually mean for you? How are countries handling this and how would you compare Trump and what would you expect of a president of the United States, uh, considered the fact that we speak of the most powerful position in the world still, so he is the most powerful man. Is this anything where you think he's living up to what he should be doing for the US and compare it to like the authoritarian leaders in Brazil or in parts of Eastern Europe, not all of them? Yeah, I, I think that there is no doubt uh, that, that Trump and the administration have mishandled terribly the crisis. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I don't focus from time to time on Trump, but I think that Trump, in my opinion, is a simply a symptom of a much deeper malaise which exists in, uh, in the US uh, and was uh, brought up by a number of policies which have been lasting for 30 years, which have been you know, associated normally with the so-called neoliberalism, including the health system, which, has been, which is extremely expensive, as you know, 70% of GDP is 17 is actually paid for health. And two health reforms had been attempted, the first one by Hillary Clinton when she was uh, working, I mean, her husband was uh, the president, and then with Obama, and both were extremely difficult. The first one failed, the second one was kind of successful, but they are extremely difficult. The power of lobbying is strong. The US is like the, practically the only advanced country that doesn't have a universal health system. Bernie Sanders was in favor of that, but that was considered something socialist, you know. Uh, you have, for example, I read yesterday an article in the Wall Street Journal that actually praises the reaction of Germany. But the article never mentions that the uh, German system is entirely different from the American system. So it mentions other things, but never focuses on that fact. So, you know, there are many underlying problems in, in I think, the US system that have re been revealed by that. And Trump, in my opinion, is just a sort of an extreme symptom of that underlying malaise, which is an economic malaise, which is a malaise of inequality, which is you know, inequality has risen. And we see that very clearly with the crisis you mentioned that before, how unequal, uh, uneven are the outcomes in terms of income and racial structure and all of that. So that's what I think for the democracies, or at least the most important democracies like the, the, like the United States. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China, as we said, actually by now looks actually to be out of the crisis. I, I look at the numbers every day. You know, China has like, I mean, ridiculously low numbers of new cases, you know, three, five, 11, something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and most of them important. And when you look at the life in streets, actually, thanks to internet, we can see that in Beijing and Shanghai, we have quasi normal life. From the point of view of somebody in Washington, that looks like we can look at that with envy and longing. Sure, and if you, I mean, if you don't handle the crisis and the infection and you cut the, or, and you end the lockdown, you will be back in trouble again. So it seems like you're yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you can move back and forth. I'd like to talk to you a little more about what you mentioned, the neoliberal crisis and the malaise of, of, of handling social structures in countries, because many people say that this is also one of the reasons why Italy, for example, was so affected or why Greece, they don't have big numbers because they made a lockdown very early, but still they will be the country that will be most affected again by the economic crisis. So what, I mean, could you let us know about the effects of the economic instruments that have been used the last 20 years, as you said, in cutting the public sector. In the Lombardy, as you say, they said that the public health system has been uh, cut as well, just to yeah, give an answer to European attempts of austerity. So you know, I, I don't know all of these details, but actually, since I work on inequality and since I work with Luxembourg you can study, we have consistent data for something like 50 countries. And of course, most of them come from the rich countries, from the advanced countries. And in, uh, going back to the previous crisis, Italy has been very strongly affected. I mean, at the aggregate level, as you know, Italy has not grown from 1999. So it's a country that actually has actually stagnated now for more than a generation. So that has to be like the opening line. <coughs> and I did actually a nice, Kind of comparison when you look at Italian uh, per capita income and the world per capita income. And Italy was in 1999, I think three times, I may be slightly wrong because I don't remember the exact detail, but I think it was three and a half times higher income than the world level. Well, by, by already 2017 or so, it has gone down to two and a half. So essentially the world is going up, obviously mostly because China, India, Indonesia, and others are going up. And Italy is in a deep-seated crisis even with, before this um, the COVID-19. And then also when you look at actually the first effects of the previous crisis, Italy with Greece 
and the Netherlands and the US is, there are only four countries among the advanced countries where everybody in the income distribution divided by percentile, 100%. They all had a decline in real income. And now you actually come with the COVID-19, which has, as we know, affected Italy very dramatically. And I don't know the financial part and I'm not discussing that. I'm just reading that what is happening with the ECB and, and uh, also with the Dalian bonds and all of that. But I think that Italy now is, uh, is facing, a, I think pretty severe, somewhat existential crisis, which might affect the European Union as well. As you're now mentioning the bonds, I mean, in, in terms of distribution of, 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 of this crisis, it, it distribution of wealth, as you said, again, there are people who are getting richer in this crisis. What could be an approach of creating measures of creating more equality after the crisis? Is there some, some instruments that uh, states, as you've been part of the World Bank, I mean, what are the measures that could actually be taken? As you know, Europe is currently going through another fight with the German um, Uh, yeah. German court and the European Central Court about euro bonds and how to handle these things on a national nation state basis or a European Union basis. Then we have the next level of the World Bank. What do you think? Will there be any measures? Can they be undertaken? And will we find the 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 unity to 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 take them? You know, of course, I will not say much about the, the European Union because that obviously is beyond my competency. And uh, there are many issues there which are actually financial issues that I don't know. Uh, but it seems to me on a political level, I think that this crisis will have its political outcome only maybe in a year or two from now, because of course the, the economic crisis will continue. Uh, the, this economic crisis comes on top of another crisis which was practically unresolved yet because essentially, as you know, the European recovery from the, from the previous crisis was very tepid and it was uh, basically barely recovering grounds and it seemed now that, it seemed now before COVID that actually Europe would eventually sort of get out of the, not, the, not technically recession, but slow growth. Well, now we have a second shock in, in something like 10, 12 years, and it's a deep and it's a very strong shock. I think in a political level, the, the, the aftermath of this shock would be felt, as I said, in a one or two years, or maybe three years, in the same way that the original shock of the global financial crisis was not felt immediately, but as we know, was felt five years and more later with the rise of right-wing parties in all European countries and, of course, Trump, if you take him as a right-wing party in the United States. However, I'm more optimistic in this case because I think in this case we have had a clear failure of policies of austerity as applied to public services and to public goods like health and also you can, by extension, say education infrastructure. So I think it's a crisis which would give uh, the, to the left and opportunity to become much more important. I have in mind, like for example, the news in France today that actually a Green Party or part of the Greens are now of, of sort of taking their position or distance with respect to the Macron's party. So I think that actually it would be a great chance for the left to do what the right has been able to do after the previous crisis, because I think here it has really revealed the issues with which only the state and the left can, uh, I mean, the state can do and the left can propose the measures that I believe would make sense. So in Germany, we talk about the fact that this crisis has in a way unmasked the right movements of the world, because it, uh, until now we had the feeling that there was really a march, that they would be having answers and uh, attractiveness that we couldn't resist. And suddenly in this crisis, all the countries that are led by right-wing movements are sort of not proving to be well ma good managers. Whereas, as you said, liberal countries like Germany or even left countries seem to have better answers. So I think that is a good idea. I would like to go to another topic that you've been pointing out and I think is very interesting is that you have been keeping in mind that Eastern European countries are actually managing this crisis very well and that they are in need of uh, rebalancing their status in Europe, and maybe that this crisis could be 
a chance of them getting a new position in yeah acknowledging their uh, their systems and their capacity to be a worthful member of the European Union because for some time people had the feeling that they're keeping the borders closed and protecting central Europe from refugees but what else and now they seem to be more capable of handling the crisis what do you think about this phenomenon that's quite striking We, you've um, shared a guardian article on this i mean what do you think does it mean to these countries and what could we learn from these countries you know you know that's a very good question i of course i'm not a specialist i cannot say much but of course i look at numbers and what i found striking in the discussion until very recently is that nobody paid any attention to the numbers from Eastern European countries. The discussion was always between Denmark and Sweden, Sweden and Norway. And of course the UK became a disaster case and Italy was a disaster case before and so on. Uh, but the numbers in East European countries, starting with uh, Estonia, all the way to Albania and to Greece, are strikingly better than the West European. No, there are many explanations. There is a, they probably had more time. They took things more seriously. They, they are maybe are, although that's really hard to believe that they're less integrated because actually many of these countries like the Czech Republic and Slovakia, they are so integrated in the West European, I mean, they're Central Europe. They're actually physically people travel like uh, between one and another within half an hour. Uh, so in any case, whatever is the reason, I think that it was really unacknowledged. So it was not noticed. And I think what is interesting there is uh, that some kind of prejudice, which I think exists in the West, in other words, it's the result of 30 years of what I called lecture. There is a permanent lecturing, which comes from Western Europe to Eastern European countries, whether it is about the courts, whether it was about migration, whether it was about uh, transparency, corruption, everything. Well, in this case, we have the opposite. We have actually the situation where East European countries have done much better than the West European countries. And it's not noticed at all, practically, until very recently. But uh, what I found interesting also is that if it had been the reverse, which actually in some sense one could have expected, the answers would be very forthcoming because you would say, well, exactly, they had a decrepit you know, um, uh, health system. They all live together in the Soviet blocks, all to, uh, Soviet built kind of blocks, all, you know, small apartments. So there are, there are families of, you know, grandmother, uh, you know, uh, parents, children, they infect each other. So we would have had a multitude of explanations why they would have performed badly. But when the reality is the opposite, then we are actually totally short of explanations. So that I think is, is, is remarkable. And as I said, I don't know what is the explanation. I think that actually there will be some work done on that, but we have to start thinking about this. Yeah, I think it's just important to point out and not to lose this out of sight because it's an actually very interesting moment um, in the European balance where you see, the, as you said, they like to be superior, maybe chauvinistic, talking about these kind of developments. And now you find um, countries very capable, certainly also because of the fear they have of their health system not being capable of, of handling these, these amounts of people. Uh, being uh, sick. So I would like to get back to the question of, yeah, balancing back, bouncing back. I remember when we had the last big crisis in Germany, they said, you know, in Europe, they said it would like take 10 years till the economy would be running well. When this crisis started, everybody was optimistic, like, yes, we can handle this and uh, the, the state can, can jump in and we can do this. And it will be, yeah, maybe a few percent will be lost, but it will be bouncing back. Now there's more insecurity. The percentages are rising. So what does this mean? Um, Peter Altmaier, Germany's um, minister, has just said that uh, after the crisis, financial crisis in 2008, it was the last, we thought it's going to take 10 years. It took two years. So what do you think with a pandemic of this size, with a global shutdown that we're experiencing and the globalization being, is there any way to think of uh, bouncing back for the globalized economy and for the normalization of what we have known? And if not, what would that mean? You know, we, this is an unprecedented situation. We never had anything like that. I mean, in the global uh, 
uh, in, in real pandemic and really affecting the entire world. Let me sort of give two examples. If you go back to 1918, 1919 pandemic, which actually we believe, of course, this one is not over, but we believe that that one eventually would will be much more, that the current one would be less uh, severe and would kill fewer people than the 1918, 1919 pandemic. Uh, that, but that pandemic did not kill lots of people, did not have the economic impact of what the current one might have, partly because I think we are actually sort of are in a different point of development. We value human lives more than they were valued then. And 1918 pandemic, 1919 pandemic came after the World War I and during the revolutions actually in Russia, in Germany, in Hungary. So basically it was just one, yet another murderous event among others. Uh, and of course it was really in India, very significant, the, the 1918, 1919 pandemic. So this is something unprecedented in, that we didn't have before because we, as I said, now we have both the health issue and an economic, very sort of uh, grave, very acute economic issue. If, as some people believe, if this pandemic were to be resolved very quickly, and then we would have what we call the, the V recovery. So we have a very sharp decline at first, and then we have a sudden, a very sharp rebound. But that doesn't seem to be the case because so long as we don't have effective treatment or we don't have a vaccine, we probably will go into the periods or sort of stop and go. Stop and go meaning you actually start, op I mean, go opening up the economy and then you stop because infections go up and you keep on going, going like that. And even when you look now what is happening in Asia where they are of course improving, you notice that the number of steps, which is essentially means increased costs of travel and communication, they're all increasing because it is, you, you know, you have to have, if you have to check temperature on every person that enters the store, you have to have somebody who is doing that. So it's actually a cost. So you're increasing costs all over. And I think that would make uh, the, the recovery slower. And again, it is, it's, nobody's, it's everybody's guess, nobody knows, but it can actually run for a number of years until either the virus miraculously disappear, like H1N1 disappeared eventually, or, or, or we now found a vaccine, or we have a vaccine, or we have an effective treatment. So how long can it last? I mean, I, my guess is like as good as, as yours or anybody's, it can go on for two years, it can go for longer, but uh, it would not be a pleasant uh, period. I, I called it in one something that long, it, it's going to be a long winter of um, economic, uh, if not decline or economic stagnation. Let's talk about the tolls that the people will have to pay and what people will have to pay which tolls. I mean, I don't know if you have read the article in The Atlantic where they said that this crisis is going to bring women back into the 50s, like the economic situations in the households will bring women back to uh, traditional family roles. They will lose their job because they often work part time. Have you come across data that are interesting for us to know about how it affects families or gender inequality and what will that mean? I mean, what I read is that Ebola, for example, took women three or four years to bounce back into where they had been in gender equality and income, I mean, income improvement if we think about um, equal pay, but we are nowhere less near. And now there's this kind of crisis, the lockdown affects families and women particularly. So what do you think in terms of, yeah, who, who will be affected in which way? Very interesting. I have not read this article in, in, in the Atlantic, uh, but I have no, I've seen actually people are reporting. That's obviously a very small area, but people are reporting that uh, the journal articles uh, written by men have increased in the number of submissions. I'm assuming that men essentially the implication being that you know men or professors, or academics, whatever, they just sit at home, keep on writing. But the submissions from women have declined. Uh, again, the implication being that essentially that the, that the household chores are now being distributed 
in a sort of a traditional way, when traditional way means that probably like three quarters of the chores are done by women. Uh, so it could be that uh, that I think during the, the lockdown, they did the distribution of the chores really sort of goes back to kind of a traditional role, which of course is unfavorable to women. And it could continue. And uh, if, for example, unemployment numbers remain as, uh, as bad as they are, uh, we might have another situation in the sense that, uh, as we know that, you know, it is very often the people who are the last to be employed, and in very often this could be second earners who are often women because they're earning some, I suppose, less than men, they are the, the first one to be fired and the last one to be hired. So we might have actually a period where the, the gender inequality in terms of income, in terms of unemployment and so on, becomes even more uh, striking than it is now. It could be, that, as you said, that actually there will be a setback for uh, the position of women uh, because of the crisis. And they could actually maybe apply in countries like the United States also to the position of African Americans and maybe even this. Um, we're coming close to the end, and I won't, uh, yeah, I will not go over a very interesting thing that you have posted on your blog today. Maybe you know that, um, yeah, I'm a writer myself, so your approach to literature and economy has particularly charmed me and fascinated me. That in, in the first book you started doing this was The Have and the Have Nots where through your marital conversation, you had the chance of looking at literature in a very different way from a very unusual perspective. And I think it's a very interesting post and a very interesting way to read literature. And I would like to hear something about, yeah, this, uh, this way of an eco eco economist reading books and what you get out of them and which books tell you what about societies and inequality. Yeah, that's, I think, a very good question. And I'm, I'm, good. I'm sorry, but I, my, my technicians are just telling me, um, can you somehow um, do, um, turn on the, the mic and turn it off because you have some interferences with your uh -huh. microphone? So, yeah, let me do that. Okay, so... Let's see. Is this better now? Yes, you're back. Yes, there have there have been some interferences. Now you're back. Uh, uh, no, yes. it's no. It now it's again. It's a little bit disturbing. Do you have a headphone? You know, this, no, this could be this computer created a problem. I have to. So I have turned this off now. Okay, we will see. We will see if it is better. Let me. Is it better now? Mm, I, no. I'm waiting for them to tell me. So maybe you can just try. Uh, no, you, you should try again to turn on and off the microphone. Let me, let me. Mute and unmute. Yes. I unmuted it now. No, you're and you're, and the laptop is gone. The other laptop you have turned off. Uh, turned yes, off. it is gone. It is gone. I turned it off. Yeah. No. Suddenly we have interferences with the uh, audio. Oh, too bad. So that's the, that's too bad. We had actually very good connection, I think, before. Yes, I think so. But now the the audio is. I mean, we still have a good picture, but we don't have a good audio. Well, let me. Maybe now. Mm. No, it's I can still hear something, but maybe it will. Hello. Can, can you hear me? Hear you? Yes. I, I, I cannot can hear see me. any. I cannot see any problem at all. So. Well, I, you sound as if there's airplane running. You have a headphone head headset near. I actually have nothing here. I cannot see what it, what did it just happen suddenly? Yes, it just happened uh, suddenly. But I think we want to hear that last story. So let's yeah, imagine yeah, it's yeah, airplanes yeah. and we can still somehow hear you. Um, I can hear your, your voice is 
one one line is okay and in another line there's a little interference it's great, yeah yes but um i think it's very interesting and we should have the whole video with this aspect because it's an interesting and unusual part that you have also yeah translated economic perspectives into analyzing literature and we should say tell our audience a little bit about that yeah let's let's try it again i don't know how much of that we would get but uh, uh, uh yeah i said I'm, I'm very glad that you asked this question the 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 origin of that was uh, essentially my wife, who was actually a big admirer of uh, Jane Austen, and then she made me read that. Uh, you know, when I came to the United States, I actually I never heard of practical. I think that I never heard of Jane Austen. Uh, you know, she was not even in the U.S. I think so popular in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, my knowledge of English literature was always pretty limited. So anyway, so then she told me, okay, and I really like, I mean, I, I was really taken by, by Jane Austen and I, as I mentioned, Pride of Prejudice was the first one, then Emma, Mess was part, these are the part, these are the three ones that they were. But one day, day when we were discussing, talking about, you know, Darcy, you know, Elizabeth, whatever, I was surprised when my wife actually knew exact amounts that Darcy had and how much the Elizabeth's family had and all that. So then I was then working with um, uh, English social tables in a paper that I did with Peter Lindbergh and Jeffrey Beers. And the social tables are actually what started in England and then spread to the rest of the world. They would actually write down different uh, social groups, you know, in some cases 30, 40 social groups and estimate the average income. And this is the source of income inequality data from the 17th, 18th century, the only one that we have. And then it sort of occurred to me, wow, look, but this is really a, a great uh, a way to actually think about the monetary or economic uh, uh, underlying uh, uh, sort of uh, underlining part of the book. So that actually made me think, well, I can locate each of them in the income distribution of England of the, of the early 19th century. And that's what I then used to write as, as, as to used to have as a vignette in my book, uh, The Haves and the Have Nots, published in 2010. And then I used also Anna Karenina in the same way as I used Elizabeth Bennett, very similar kind of a book. And I thought of using Balzac, Lafayette, Gaviot, but um, uh, I thought it was like two vignettes is enough. Now, Piketty, of course, used uh, uh, later uh, Jane Austen as well and uh, Balzac, because Balzac is really a phenomenal example, because you can use the whole uh, comedy you met with, you know, hundreds of it, thousands of examples and money. And the more recently, uh, this is the last point I want to make, the more recently, they, uh, Daniel Shapiro from the uh, uh, New York University did actually a book which now takes nine different uh, uh, books and interprets it not only in terms of numbers, I basically work in terms of numbers, but he interprets it broadly, more broadly, you know, uh, sociologically, economically, anthropologically, what they tell us about the societies, uh, in, those, in his case, about US, uh, UK, and France from the 19th century up to the Gilded Age in the United States in 1920s. I think it's a great way of doing it. Last point, simply to mention, it's not easy to find sufficient number of books, I think, in other languages that do uh, have uh, information in a form that is actually interesting for economists to put in a sort of numerical way. And that's why I said actually people should try to find them. I'm sure in German literature that must exist, but you know, uh, it may not be as numerous as uh, you know, 19th century. Um, French or maybe English. What I found interesting is that you said you've been looking for other books that um, that were published later, but there were almost no more um, no more information about the socioeconomic status. So it seems that only in this time it was so important for the writers to demonstrate wealth and social status in their books. Um, and I I think it's so funny to read that you had Anna Karenina. And, uh, and all these romantic things who are actually a, really a rise in, like you, it's actually a pretty woman story. If you, if you translate, I mean, if you interpret it, it's the woman marrying somebody who will totally bring her into a different kind of society. And you pointed, yeah, you pointed that out in a, in a very entertaining way. 
Um, Branko, just for the la very last thing, and maybe I don't know if I will get you by surprise because I haven't read much about this, but often we yeah, complain about our Eurocentric vision of the world. And we have talked about China, we have mentioned Asia, we have talked about Europe, but we have not talked about Africa. And we know that China is heavily engaged into Africa, Europe is engaged, we have a colonial history with it. Um, what is your take on, I mean, Africa still doesn't have high numbers, but we don't know if they're not measuring them or testing them and what's going to happen to the continent. But how do you think, or in terms of inequality, we know that there's a lot to talk about. We don't have much time, but maybe just a few thoughts on, yeah, Corona, COVID, and the interconnectedness between China, Africa, Europe, Africa, USA, Africa. Is there anything that you have thought about that would be interesting to share? I mean, very briefly, actually, in, in, my, in my recent book, of Capitalism Alone, I actually spent some time talking about China, because the whole chapter is on China. But then one part of the chapter deals with China Belt and Road Initiative and role in Africa. I'm a big uh, sort of, uh, how should I say, I have a very positive view about that. I actually think that China, by working on infrastructure projects in Africa, could potentially transform Africa uh, in maybe similar ways that Asia was transformed. You know, many people like take, uh, you take Gunnar Myrdal to 19. 50s wrote the book, the, the Asian Dilemma, and many people believe in the 1950s that Asia is condemned to become, to remain always poor because there will be so many people and so few resources and they would always remain poor. What happened was actually the opposite. Uh, actually, Asia is now the most dynamic part of the world economy. Now, it could be that actually in the 21st century or maybe in the 22nd century, Africa plays the same role. And I think in order for Africa to play that role, it has to be much better integrated internally, which means infrastructure is of crucial importance. If you cannot transport things by if there are no roads, I mean, what are you going to do? If you don't have electricity. So I, in that sense, I view China's role very favorably. And I think I view it also indirectly favorably because it will push Western countries to pay much more attention to Africa simply because they see now the Chinese presence in Africa as some kind of geopolitical sort of game. So uh, that, that's why I think actually the, the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative is, is a good thing. Now, what will happen in Africa, obviously we don't know. Uh, Africa will keep on playing just very briefly on that, a very important role in global inequality because it's a continent, as you know, with the highest increase in population. So, so far, Africa played relatively small role globally because the population-wise of the sub-Saharan Africa was not that, that large, but now it will become larger and larger, the only part of the world that will grow. And that has implications also for Europe because with the current gaps in income, which are 10 to one between Europe and Africa, you will have always a huge incentive to migrate. So the migration problems that Europe faces are not problems which will be solved from one summer to another. It is a problem of, of secular duration. And that means that Europe does have a very high incentive also to help Africans grow if they don't want really, you know, 100 million people to, to migrate to you. That's very interesting. And I would like to have a, 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 a dig into one thing you said. You said you, you look at China favorably and that they will foster the infrastructure. They are doing the same thing in Eastern Europe. As you know, they're investing in a huge program between Serbia into Croatia. So um, how do you look at the moral dilemma that's been debated? Like we have a country that is playing the role that the United States used to play, but not with the soft powers that we are used to have in this whole economic uh, processes. Is this a matter for you or is this something that you look at? Is it, I mean, there's people who always said, well, when the United States was expanding in this way, they always brought democracy as well. And now we have China and we don't know what, yeah, they're not bringing democracy with the economies. So how do you look at, at this? Are these, are they, is there a danger when we talk of authoritarian regimes? that if China engages into the economy stronger, that they will not look at democratic values and, I mean, human rights, the freedom of speech, all these matters that used to matter to us and that used to be a negotiating sector when we expanded, when we would say, if you want to engage in, 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 a, 
in an economic exchange, we have certain values that we would have or should have shared. I mean, we've left that behind for some time, but still, yeah, if you have this vacuum that the U.S. is withdrawing a little and then the China is getting stronger and stronger, do you see a moral dilemma or is it, I mean, how would you handle this? Honestly, I don't see very much of a moral dilemma. I, I see China's role uh, also favorably in Europe because it's a role which is essentially based on uh, trade, on technology, using resources, and of course selling things. And as you know now, the, I mean, the links between China and Europe, not least and only, but Western Europe as well, uh, land links will become and are becoming actually more important that cuts the number of days that uh, goods have to travel from, I think, plus, I mean, more than 30 days to something like 16 or 17 days. So it's actually, I think, big advantage. And I think integration of the Asian continent has been historically huge distance, quick, you know, forever. I think it's something which uh, the next century is really, I think, benefit a lot. You can actually basically think of the Eurasian continent, particularly all the part of Russia, which is very, very weakly populated, as some future United States in the sense that, uh, that the development opportunities there are, I think, enormous, because not only is it rich in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, raw materials, but it would actually benefit for climate, from climate change and it is actually part where you can have lots of, I mean, there is lots of land and uh, lots of possibilities to agricultural production and other things. So I see that integration very favorably. Uh, I don't think that the Chinese are particularly interested in having a political influence, like uh, what type of government we want to have. Uh, so I think they basically ignore that. Uh, whether countries themselves might find it, or the elites in those countries might find it interesting to emulate Chinese political system. It's a different issue. They might find it interesting because they themselves have an interest to be rulers who are not very much constrained by rules. You know, I think Serbia is a good example of that. Uh, and but it is not something that China is insisting. So I think China is indifferent to the political environment of the country so long as that country is willing to trade with China, to accept investments and so on. I think it's hypocritical, and I've written about that from the European Union, to criticize China for those investments. If Europe believes that they should not be there, then Europe should actually pay the countries not to have Chinese investment. But you cannot actually complain that somebody is bringing investment and you do not. Yeah, that is true. But to be fair, I mean, I think that the, the investment that the European Union gave in that area is even higher than what China does. But China is presenting and selling the investment better. It's what, what I have read is that the European Union is factually investing a lot, but not being able to communicate its investment, whereas the Chinese are. So I think they have soft powers <laughs> in, in a way they have developed them. Yeah. I yeah. agree with you, actually, when you look at the numbers, obviously all these countries are much better integrated with the European Union because they trade, you know, 80% of trade is with the European Union countries. But it is ironic, I mean, I agree with you what you're saying, but it's ironic that the European Union, which has thousands of advisors who are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to advise them how to, you know, uh, help the soft power, cannot project that soft power. And I think they actually should really think why they cannot project it. Uh, why don't they actually advertise it more? I'll give an example that I remember that actually from the early 2000s. I remember in Belgrade, you had uh, uh, Japanese government that gave uh, buses for free. Each of these buses had a sign, a gift from the people of Japan. Well, you know, everybody who takes the bus notices that. So you have to advertise what you're doing. What I think, unfortunately, is what the European Union does is essentially in non-member countries, but even in member countries, essentially has a small, group, small groups of people who actually think the same way that people in Brussels think. They organize conferences, they talk to each other, and that's where the story ends. In other words, they don't communicate with people. And you need to actually learn to communicate with people. You have to have people actually, for example, give another example, Chinese ambassadors speak the language of the country. How many European ambassadors speak the language of the country? You would not find almost anybody. 
So, you know, you cannot have soft power if you can, can, cannot communicate with people. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, we could go into Europe and how they are failing this crisis. I mean, everybody is being disappointed about also the lack of European solidarity. If we look at Germany and Italy, the reactions came far too late. And China created the image of flying in and getting all the masks to the people. And you had videos of Italians burning the European flags. And you had, I mean, images of doctors from Latin America flying in to help Italy, but European being lethargic, totally. So I think what you are saying is very important that we understand that sort of this parallel world that the European bureaucracy has created and hardly anything what happens inside that um, box goes out and people realize what the value of the European Union is and we don't have the politicians to stress this kind of factor yeah so Branco I think we have yeah we have come to a little longer than one hour of a conversation during lockdown I had so many papers and so many more questions but um, we are through I am yeah, another time. I am very grateful you gave us uh, an hour of uh, your thoughts and presence and it was very nice to yeah, engage with you in Washington. We are here in Heidelberg currently. Um, we will try to maybe fix the, the audio in the end. I don't know what happened, but I could hear you. I hope the audience could as well. The video will be online on the, on the YouTube channel of the Intercultural Center. We have it on Facebook, on Twitter, and you can look it up and look at um, what we have just talked and, and yeah, engage in a debate. I don't know about more questions because we are over time already. So Branko, I would say thank you very much for sharing and joining in. Thank you and stay healthy. And I hope we will read from you. Thank you very much, Jago. It was a pleasure. And I hope next time we can do it in person in Heidelberg so that the, when the crisis is over. That would be great. That would be wonderful to have you here. Bye-bye, Branco. Take care. Take good care. Bye-bye.